Hey Amen. Um, so we're going to go back to our first and second Samuel series today. And we are going to do second Samuel uh, chapter five, six and seven. So go ahead and open up your Bible. Second Samuel chapter five. My original title was uh, very hard teachings. But I didn't think that would fire you guys up. So, <laughs> so instead, uh, I've entitled it Victory in the Spirit. Victory in the Spirit. It is the year of the Spirit, is it not? Yeah. I think this will encourage you, but uh, it will be a challenging lesson. So buckle yourselves in. Uh, in verse 3. It says, when all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. So prior to this, uh, David was king over Judah, and then all the elders came together and said, you know what, you've got it all now. And so now he becomes king over all of Israel, and they anoint him as king. And so, you know, the Bible says that David has a heart after God. And uh, he's such a great example of courage and righteousness and trusting in God. He wrote most of the Psalms, uh, just an amazing man of God. And uh, I know what you're thinking, well, he was anointed. Of course, he was awesome. But I want to remind you of something. So go ahead and keep your finger here and uh, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 21, now who wrote this? The Holy Spirit used Paul to write this. This is God's word, is it not? Okay, verse 21, I want to make sure you read this, and it's not Dave Swan, it's the Bible. Amen. It says here, now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. If you studied the Bible, became a disciple of Jesus... Because that's the only one who's qualified to get baptized, amen? And so if you were baptized as a disciple of Jesus, all your sins were forgiven, then this happened. You were anointed by God, and he put his Holy Spirit in you. And so you, too, can have victory in the Spirit. Let's go back to 2 Samuel chapter 5. So let's learn from David here, and let's try to have his heart through these hard teachings. 2 Samuel, chapter 5, we'll start in verse 6. It says, the king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusites said to David, you will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. They thought, David cannot get in here. And so what's he doing? Well, God put it on his heart to make Jerusalem Zion, to be the home base for where God and his ark and his temple will be built. And so he's got to go and defeat the Jebusites. And so when Joshua was given the promised land, they were supposed to ward off all the Jebusites, but they didn't get it done. And so David and his men are going to go and get that land. And the Jebusites are like, Even our blind and lame will defeat your army. (laughs) And so let's see what happens. Verse 7. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, which is the city of David. It doesn't tell us how he did it. It just, he did it. He had victory. Yep, he got it done. And verse 9 says, David then took up residence in the fortress and called it the city of David. He built up the area around it from the terrace inward, and he became more and more powerful because the Lord God Almighty was with him. He had victory after victory in the spirit. And so, you know, I was looking back at uh, the church over 2021. I just want to share some of my favorite victories. You ready? Yeah. Okay. So uh, Linda 
was baptized in March. Uh, John Green was restored. In March. Uh, Sharon Groman was added to the church. In March. Thank you for coming home. Um, let's see. Uh, Rachel uh, was baptized. In Joe and Sybil placed membership. Uh, James and Georgia got restored in July. Uh, Christian got baptized. Levi gets baptized in August. Zamir gets baptized in August. Ashton and Avery. Tyrese joins us. When was that? In August. Uh, Chris Neptune gets baptized in September. Yes, sir. Yes. That was in October. Uh, Jamaica gets restored in October. And Jamari gets baptized in October. We were planning on building a teen ministry, but God did that. And yeah. we have our teen ministry right here. Wow. He gave us two new cranking singles ministries. We now have two appointed shepherding couples. Wow. We have new dating couples, engagements, a wedding, a renewal of vows, uh, a vows, and uh, a vows. What well, do you mean, some vows? <laughs> and of course, sweet Anayel was born. <laughs> God has given us victory after victory here in Syracuse. My first hard teaching from chapter five, victory brings Satan's attacks. Let's read here in 2 Samuel, chapter five, verse 17. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they went up in full force to search for him. But David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord, shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? The Lord answered him, go, for I will surely deliver the Philistines into your hands. It's awesome how David stays close to God. He sees the attack coming and he prays <laughs> like, God, am I going to be victorious? Verse 20, so David went to Baal Perazim, and there he defeated them. He said, as waters break out, the Lord has broken out against my enemies before me. So that the place was called Baal Perazim. The Philistines abandoned their idols there, and David and his men carried them off. You know, we have victories. We get friends baptized. And then what happens is you start to get tempted. Uh, the world tempts you. Uh, you start getting <laughs> doubts, maybe you fall into sin, you start to think, what am I doing here? Uh, you know, all these things start to come at you. And then you go to God, you're like, God, help me through this. And he gives you victory, he helps you through those temptations, and he helps you to be victorious. But what happens? Well, if Satan doesn't give up. Look at verse 22. Once more, the Philistines came up and spread out in the Valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord, and he answered, do not go straight up, but circle around behind them and attack them in front of the poplar trees. As soon as you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the poplar trees, move quickly, because that will mean the Lord has gone out in front of you to strike the Philistine army. So David did as the Lord commanded him, and he struck down the Philistines all the way from Gibeon to Gezer. There's only one reason Satan attacks you. You know what it is? I'm going to help you out. You ready? Yeah. To get you to stop sharing Jesus. That's, that's the only reason he attacks you. So he comes at you. He gives you friends maybe that uh, aren't spiritual. You start to hang out with them. Uh, or he, he tempts you. You sin. You don't get open about it. And so now you feel like a hypocrite talking about Jesus. Um, maybe one of your friends... Maybe the person that baptized you, that invited you to church, falls away. And, and you're like, oh, I can't share my faith. This is what's going to happen. They're, they're, they're going to get baptized and they're going to fall away. Jesus has gotten in there maybe once, twice, 
not Jesus. Satan. <laughs> Satan's attacked you. Uh, and and he's, he's hurt you. And so now you just don't share your faith anymore. And so he's victorious. He's now won the battle. And so when you're victorious, Satan is going to attack. And if you have not been sharing your faith, well, he's winning right now. But here God gives the answer. He says, don't just get up and go. Because this is what happens. You stop putting God first and the Bible and prayer and sharing your faith is over here. And so you just get up and you go to work. You get up. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to be okay. I'm part of the fellowship. Uh, I just got to get my life in order. And he says, don't do that. He said, instead, go around back. <laughs> uh, and look what happens. He says, it will mean the Lord has gone out in front of you. See, what happens is you forget to put God first and you go first. And then the mission and prayer and all those things stay in the back. And you're like, hey, I, I haven't fallen away. I'm still coming to church. Well, if if God, if Satan has got you to shut up, well, you have fallen away. Uh, and so you, you've got to understand, you got to get back, start praying, start considering who is God putting in front of you. Make sure that God goes out first so that you can be victorious again. Because victory brings Satan's attacks. And I know because I... I <laughs> At the beginning of December, is like, I'm going to finish this year off stronger than ever. And uh, uh, and what happens? Uh, I get COVID. I'm out, like, for two weeks. Like, it just it hit me really hard. I was like, my kids came to visit, and they're out going to uh, basketball games and watching movies, and I'm in bed sweating. I just felt horrible, and I couldn't be with them. But that's, that's what happened. Satan attacked, and... Uh, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really took me going down to the New York um, City Winter Workshop and getting filled, sitting there hearing one lesson after another. So uh, I hope you guys are fired up for the Winter Workshop next yeah. week. And so the challenge here is have your time with God before you go out to the world. Amen. 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 Have your time with God before you go out in the world and let God lead you. Uh, Amen. Amen. Okay. Second hard teaching. Chapter six. Isn't it hard, bro? Amen. <laughs> uh, okay. Chapter six starts off with David wanting to bring the ark. And so he gets some of his friends together and they're celebrating. Uh, verse five says, David and all the Israelites were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with the uh, uh, castanets, harps, Lears, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. Verse 6, when they came to the thresh, threshing floor of Nekon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down, and he died there beside the ark of God. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah, and to this day that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. And so he gets some of his friends. He's going to get the ark. He's going to bring it to Zion. And so uh, if you don't know what the ark is, the ark uh, is uh, made with the, the wings of angels, the cherubim, uh, as a cover. And God actually spoke from the middle of the wings. And inside the ark, you had uh, the commandments from Moses. You had uh, Aaron's staff that budded. The, it represents the fruitfulness of Jesus. Uh, and you had the, the manna. And Jesus says, I am the manna, right? So he is the word. He is the staff, the leadership, the fruitfulness. Uh, and uh, he is the, the word of life, the bread of life. And so the ark is uh, what you want in your life. And in the New Testament, we all represent that. How we live our lives represents Jesus. The things that we say, the things that we do, our fruitfulness, our lack of fruitfulness, say who we are and what we do. And here he's moving the ark. And it says here, irreverent act. In most translations, it's his um, lack of understanding. 
uh, you know how you get pulled over and the cops come and they said, did you know that you can't do this? And you're like, no, I didn't know that. Well, it doesn't matter. You're still going to get that ticket, right? <laughs> and so ignorance is really what the issue was. He was ignorant of how to move the ark. And, uh, and so God's like struck him down. First, David's angry. But then in verse nine, it says he was afraid. And so what happened? What happened from the time that he was angry to the time that he was afraid? Well, I believe the answer is found in Chronicles. Look over in First Chronicles chapter 15. Yeah. It's the yeah. same story, but uh, you'll see a different perspective here. In verse 13, well, you see it at the top of chapter 15, verse 1, it says the ark brought to Jerusalem. So this is the account of his second time. So he does it again three months later, and he's successful at bringing it. And he actually studies the Bible and realizes that he was doing it wrong. And so you see in verse 13, it says it was... Uh, because you, the Levites, did not bring it up the first time that the Lord, our God, broke out in anger against us. We did not inquire of him about how to do it in the prescribed way. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves in order to bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. Uh, and so he appoints the people that are supposed to do it. He appoints the leadership, gets them to understand how we're supposed to do this. And then in verse 28, it says, so all Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with shouts, with sounds of ram horns, trumpets, and cymbals, and the playing of lyres and harps. As the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord was entering the city of David, uh, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a win window, and when she saw King David dancing and celebrating, she despised him in her heart. And so um, he studies the Bible out and realizes that he was doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. And so that's why fear broke into him. It was his fault that his best mm -hmm. friend died. Mm -hmm. And because uh, they weren't doing it God's way. So my second point is obey for there is no other way. I requested that song, by the way. <laughs> trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Obey, for there's no other way. Uh, let's go back to 2 Samuel chapter 6. So first time he had his friends, the second time he had all of Israel participating. And I think for myself, I look at all the victories. I go, man, why did I get sick? What was God trying to teach me? And I think this is it, is that we had all these victories, but there was only a few of us moving the ark. And so God's like, sick, think about what you've done this year. You've been sentimental towards people that have been around for 10, 15, 20 years, and you haven't called them to move the ark the right way. And so you need to quit doing that because you're killing them. These people are your yeah. friends. You love these people. Mm -hmm. You, I love you guys. Uh, yet I haven't called you to the standard that we've all agreed to when we said Jesus is Lord. And so I want to challenge us all to um, <clears throat> go back. I remember in 2006... Uh, Jill and I had been away from the church uh, for two years, three years, but even before that, I would say even two or three years before that, we weren't really, I mean, we were going to church, but we weren't about our purpose. And so I'm not sure when we actually left God. We were still going to church and giving our contribution and all that stuff, um, but we weren't behaving like disciples. We were having children, we were building our business, um, but we weren't about, like being a disciple wasn't number one, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No. And, uh, and so I remember being at dinner and we had a friend over, uh, I had actually baptized him like seven years before and we were just catching up our relationship and we were talking about God and stuff. And I looked over on the bookshelf and there was a first principles book 
and I hadn't seen it, you know, actually opened it in, I don't know, years. <laughs> and so I opened it up and I'm like, okay, I'm going to do discipleship with me. And so I did discipleship with myself. And I was like, am I a fisher of men? No. Oh my goodness. Do I deny myself every day and carry my cross? No. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, Jill. You know, Jill was making spaghetti in the kitchen. I'm like, Jill, I'm not a disciple. I'm not saved. She's like, stop it. We're all disciples here. <laughs> she was in denial. <laughs> but I was looking at the scripture like, oh my gosh, I'm in trouble. I, I need to make a change. And because I did that, I reached out to some real disciples who got into our lives, restored us, and got us back on track. And so what I'd like you to do this week before the, uh, the winter workshop, open it up look at yourself, count the cost with yourself. Are you seeking God with all your heart? Is the word your standard? Are you a fisher of men? Are you seeking first the kingdom of God? Are you confessing your sins and allowing the blood of Jesus to forgive you of all your sins? Count the cost with yourself. Are you willing to go anywhere, do anything, give up everything uh, to love God with all your hearts, mind, and soul? Amen? Hard teachings. Second Samuel chapter six. Verse 14. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts, the sounds of trumpets. Man, sometimes I just close my eyes, I go, What what must he have been doing? You know, just dancing with <laughs> you know when jill and i we go dancing we do uh just i don't know what you call it but i learned this from my cousin you just put two thumbs out like this and then you make circles pointing at yourself and so we just kind of do this <laughs> <laughs> well, that's our dancing but that's not all your might you know what i'm saying like he was dancing with all his might just fired up a couple of teens came up to me this morning they were challenged to encourage three people today and two of them decided oh, yeah. to pick me and after after the first one after the first one yeah Zavir comes up with the second one he's like i'm gonna encourage you i started dancing <laughs> so fired up and he's gonna encourage me so and he used the scripture and i was super encouraged but david he was so happy the ark is coming to zion it says here in verse 16 as the ark of the lord was entering the city of david michael daughter of saul watched from a window and when she saw king david leaping and dancing before the lord she despised him in her heart wow. says they brought the ark of the lord and set it in its place inside the tent of david had pitched for it and david sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the lord after whew, a little tired there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. after he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings he blessed the people in the name of the lord almighty then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of, of Israelites, both men and women. And all the people went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as vulgar fellow would. David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people of Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. So... I mean, let's just be real. That just means they didn't have any sex. The love was gone. Like she disrespected uh, David and David was ticked off at her disrespect. And uh, what did she have in her heart? Well, she had bitterness in her heart. My third point is bitterness destroys true love. Remember what he did for her. I mean, she was 
his true love. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he like sacrificed his life killing Philistines to get her. Mm -hmm. And uh, he really loved her, but because of her bitterness, it destroyed true love. Mm -hmm. And this can happen in our walk with God. Mm -hmm. We can have bitterness towards God because he hasn't answered prayers. Uh, or, or we can have bitterness towards a brother or sister or even people that aren't part of the church, mm -hmm. and it can destroy our relationship mm -hmm. uh, with God. Oh. Look over in Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to help you guys out with this. Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 12. In verse 14, it says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Bitterness destroys relationships. It destroys marriages. Um, you can hold something uh, against other people. And it says it's a root. You know, you can't see the root of those trees over there. It's hidden. And it's the same thing. You can't see the bitterness inside of someone. Uh, but it defiles many, but it's in there. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to deal with it. So how do you deal with it? Verse 14, make every effort to live at peace. Mm -hmm. When you're not at peace, you have bitterness. Mm -hmm. If you don't feel the peace of, of God in your life, you have a bitter root in your heart. And you yeah. got to deal with it because not only will it destroy your relationship with God, it will... Uh, it will just it will defile other people and it'll hurt their relationship with god and so it's a it's a super important thing to deal with he says here that when you make every effort to live at peace you extend grace verse 15 see to it that no one falls short of the grace of god sometimes you got to extend grace to yourself you sin you start to think you're not worthy to be here uh, I'm different. I'm not like everybody else. Uh, why would God choose me? I can't live up to the standard. Uh, I can't be like everybody else. And you're just, it's like one bitter statement after another. Why? Because you don't extend grace to yourself. God chose you. <laughs> he anointed you. Each one of you were chosen for a reason. Get rid of that bitterness towards yourself. Extend grace to yourself. If you have bitterness towards other people, that's really self-righteousness. You're not extending grace to other people. And that's really dangerous because the Bible says with the measure you use, it will be used against you. So you want to make sure you extend grace to other people. When you extend grace, it gets rid of that bitterness. I was getting calls from uh, Corey and from Jamie. Uh, I asked Jamie if I could share this. I didn't ask Corey, but Corey's cool. He'll, he'll, <laughs> And so they were roommates for a year. And so I'm, I'm hearing that they're going to get together and duke it out. I was like, oh, uh, they got issues with each other. And, uh, and, but they were both seeking input. And I said, okay, this is what the issue is. <laughs> you got to make peace. How do you, well, how do I do that? Well, deal, take responsibility for your own stuff and don't worry about him. Share. I'm sorry for X, Y, and Z, and I want to change this year. I want to be different. And so they both did it. They both took my advice. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't there, but I asked all the brothers that were there, how'd it go? And they were like, man, it went great. Mm -hmm. And uh, I talked to Jamie. They said uh, it, it was awesome. And so yeah. for each of you, you got to desire peace in your life. It doesn't matter how the other person responds. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have issues with people that are not sold out disciples of oh, yeah. Jesus and you've got that and you just got to make peace don't worry about them you've got to apologize to them take ownership if they don't apologize back that's on them and God mm -hmm. but you got to be right with God and the only way you can do that is to get rid of anything that's keeping you from being at peace mm -hmm. bitterness destroys true love okay one last chapter chapter seven second mm -hmm. Samuel verse one after the king was settled in his palace and the lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him 
he said to Nathan the prophet, here I am living in this house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. So David has a dream, right? You know, it's, it's amazing how when we go through a series, it always relates to what we're going through. <laughs> this is a new year. We have New Year's resolutions. We have dreams. We have goals of what we want to do. And here David has this goal. I want to build a house for God. He has this amazing dream, right? It sounds good. It sounds righteous. It sounds noble. And verse 4 says, but that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan. And so God tells the prophet, go and tell Dave, that's not my plan. And, uh, and sometimes that happens to us. We have this amazing plan and uh, we write it down and we pray about it. And we're going to do that here next week, right? We're all going to make prayer goals and we're going to pray for each other. And we might have the most noble, awesome prayer. And God's like, nope, <laughs> I got something different for you. Uh, look what happens um, in chapter 7, verse 11, halfway down in B. It says, the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. So he's going to do it himself. And so who lives in a house? A family. Oh, yeah, we can raise your hand. A family. You live with a family, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah we all live in a house. But that's, that's what God wants to build. He wants to build a family. And he doesn't want a house for himself alone with the ark. He's like, no, no, I'm going to build a house. He wants to build a family. In verse 12, it says, when your days are over, so when David's dead... <laughs> It says, and you rest with your ancestors. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. Oh, look at that. So house and kingdom are synonymous here. Verse 13, he is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son interesting and so you take david and you go all the way down another 33 generations and you reach jesus and so jesus builds the kingdom the house the family that we're all a part of is that awesome um you know unanswered prayers there's a song called unanswered prayers it's a country song uh by garth brooks um, I'm going to read the lyrics for you. <laughs> I probably could. It's, it's a simple country song. I have to chain my voice a little bit. <laughs> but uh, it's a very simple, sweet song. It says, just the other night at a hometown football game, my wife and I ran in to my old high school flame. And as I introduced them, the past came back to me. And I couldn't help but think of the way things used to be. She was the one that I wanted for all times. And each night I'd spend praying that God would make her mine. And if he'd only grant me this wish, I wished back then I'd never asked for anything again. Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. She wasn't quite the angel that I remembered in my dreams. And I could tell that time had changed me and in her eyes too, it seemed. We tried to talk about the old days. There wasn't much we could recall. I guess the Lord knows what he's doing after all. And as she walked away and I looked at my wife, then and there, I thank the good Lord for the gifts in my life. Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. Remember when you're talking to the man upstairs that just because he may not answer doesn't mean he doesn't care. Some of God's greatest gifts our unanswered prayers. Wow. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Here, David had a dream of building a house for the ark, but God's dream was much, much greater. So Nathan goes and tells David, look here in verse 17. So Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. Then King David went in and sat 
before the Lord. And he said, who am I, sovereign Lord? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? Here's the king. Mm -hmm. And the most powerful king on the planet to this day. I mean, an amazing king. And yet he sits down before the Lord. He's like, who am I? You know, uh, one of the memory scriptures that we have is uh, Matthew 6, 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. righteousness. We talk about kingdom a lot, but we don't talk about righteousness. This is the definition of righteousness right here. To sit down before God and say, you are king. You're the greatest. I am nothing. That's what David is saying right here. Even though he was the most powerful man on the planet, he's like, who am I? I am nothing compared to you. Verse 20 says, what more can David say to you? For you know your servant, sovereign Lord, for the sake of your word and according to your will, you have done this great thing. My last point is God blesses his house. You know, it was uh, great uh, helping uh, James and Georgia move and seeing their new house. I mean, compared to where they were to where they are now, I'm like, man, yeah. it's an amazing house. Yeah. And uh, we want that. You know, we want to live in a, in a good house. But here, uh, David says, it's not my will, but according to your will. Mm -hmm. And so God wants us to build his house. He blesses his house. Yeah. Uh, seeking your own house forfeits your blessings from God. Mm -hmm. uh, look at uh, verse 29, how he ends this prayer. He says, now be pleased to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever in your sight. For you, sovereign Lord, have spoken. And with your blessing, the house of your servant will be blessed forever. See, God blesses his house. Mm -hmm. He wants that to be the priority in your life, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. You know, I got a call from uh, an acquaintance. Um, I studied the Bible with him once in New Jersey, like four years ago. And I hadn't heard from him since. Uh, but he asked me what I was doing in Syracuse. And I said, uh, I was helping build the church. And so he texted me back and he was like, um, so did you, are you building it from scratch? You have land, you know, what's the deal? And, uh, and so, you know, I, I, I didn't want to text back. I just called him <laughs> and I was like, no, no, no. And I shared with him that the church is not a building. It's, it's the people, mm -hmm. it's, it's the disciples. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was awesome because we, we reconnected. And uh, so he's going to be studying the Bible. Uh, his name is Debron. Pray, pray for him. I got him in touch with Luke and uh, Michael Donald down there. And uh, yeah, I mean, he's he's in a position where uh, he's ready. He, he wasn't ready four years ago, but uh, he, he's ready now. But see, that's got to be our heart. is to seek first his kingdom and, and his righteousness, and he will give you victory. So just remember, when you have victories, Satan is going to attack. But we got to obey, do it his way, for there is no other way. Amen. Get rid of all the bitterness that destroys true love. Seek peace with all your heart. And remember that God blesses his house. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and he'll give you victory in the spirit. Amen. Amen.